God, god eftermiddag mina damer och herrar. Jonas Klevhag heter jag och klockan är nu 14.15 plus några sekunder. Vi ska hålla tiden alldeles särskilt mycket denna tisdag eftermiddag här i Almedalen. Hjärtligt välkomna. Jag ska moderera sessionen E-hälsa kan spara miljarder och ge tusentals jobb. Men vad är haken? Vi kommer att hålla detta seminarium på engelska av det enkla skäl att vår huvudtalare och inledningstalare är eh, duktigast på engelska. Eh, helt enkelt, eh, Mr. Chris Wood från eh, Salt Lake City, Utah. So therefore I switch to English uh, uh, from now on and uh, give you this brief introduction. As many of you know, a growing and aging population uh, means higher healthcare costs and lower tax incomes to pay for it. So all things equal in healthcare, I am likely to not get the hip replacement I will eventually need when I eventually will need it. So basically, as many of us know, we need cheaper ways to deliver better healthcare. And digitalization is uh, a promising area where many solutions may exist, but development here is slow. So we're extremely proud to start by learning from someone who's got first-hand experience on seeing this happen, how digitalization can actually work uh, in healthcare. Uh, here to celebrate the 4th of July, uh, <laughs> uh, the vice president and uh, medical executive of Intermountain Healthcare, Salt Lake City, Utah. I give the first 18 minutes to you, Chris Wood. A uh, warm hand, please. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I've been traveling uh, through Northern Europe for the past uh, three weeks with my family, brought my children and my wife, so I'm not jet lagged. So I can't blame anything stupid that I say on that. So, uh, But uh, we were here about 10 days ago in the city of Stockholm and uh, just thoroughly enjoying the uh, way things are done so well here and the beauty of your land, of the people and, and uh, of your history. It's really amazing. We won't bring up the Vasa. Um, <laughs> I have failed many times, but never in 26 minutes. Uh, <laughs> we'll see if I do that today. Right? <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about uh, Intermountain Healthcare and the and the lessons that we've learned in our healthcare uh, history, and the especially a little bit about uh, the lessons learned in working with business partners. So why talk about Intermountain Healthcare? Why hear from them? We've had, we have a long history of visitors from Sweden and visiting Sweden, but Intermountain Healthcare started uh, in 1975 as 15 completely separate, independently run hospitals and has become a hospital system that is driving down the cost of healthcare and, the, and improving the quality of healthcare in very significant and specific ways. And hello, Mark Evans, my dear friend from high school. How are you? Good to see you. Um, Utah boasts the highest quality health at the lowest cost of any of, this, uh, of any of the 50 states in the United States. And how has that happened? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, again, uh, the 15 hospitals were given to a non-denominational board, a volunteer board in 1975. Uh, community leaders were brought together and the church that owned the 15 hospitals said, we will give you these hospitals on these conditions. Um, you will care for anyone who comes to you regardless of their ability to pay. You will be a model clinic for the world. That's a big goal from a little town in Salt Lake City, Utah. And you will provide the highest quality care at the lowest appropriate cost. And so how have we done that? A combination of gathering specific computable data, leveraging informatic skill, and leveraging quality improvement led by physicians and nurse uh, leadership, and I'll talk a little bit about that, on specific key clinical processes. We don't work on everything, we work on things that will make a big difference in quality and cost. Oh, there's my, there we go. So, uh, three million people uh, in our coverage area. We now have 24 hospitals, we, we uh, have 186 clinics. We employ about 1,500 physicians. There are 4,500 physicians that are affiliated that work with us and are obviously very important in all our quality work and, and cost improvement work. Uh, the only influence we have over them is uh, allowing them to be leaders 
in what we do and, and showing them their data and how well they're doing. Uh, these are some of the benefits of becoming a system, of instead of just being independently run hospital. We have our own ambulance, uh, air ambulance service. We have a central lab that does almost all of our laboratory work in one place. We have a central blood bank. We have one laundry that not only does all of the laundry for our hospitals and our clinics, but also for the state of Utah penitentiary system and the University of Utah and other hospital systems. So certain uh, benefits of scale have driven the cost of healthcare down in the state of Utah by leveraging scale and by leveraging some of the benefits that we have. Um, uh, another one that I'll talk about a little bit later, physician-driven preference item improvement. When we make a choice across our entire physician population that lowers the cost of a given implement in surgery by a thousand-fold or a hundred-fold, it has a huge impact over the entire population. So one of the key messages that I would take away from anything that I might say is this. Innovation thrives when it's aligned with the core business of the system. Um, there are a lot of innovative clinicians and innovative leaders who come up with great ideas. They don't succeed well unless they're aligned with the core business. Um, talk a little bit about that. Give you an example. Uh, I have a friend who is an endocrinologist and who was concerned about how to better calculate how many carbohydrates are consumed by a diabetic patient in a given meal so we can be better about giving the right amount of insulin. He invented, with our help, a tray that weighs in every part of the tray how much food is in that part of the tray. So here's the vegetables, here's the carbohydrates, here's the meat, and you can see how much uh, all of those sections weighed at the start of the meal and how much weighed at the end. And then you can give exactly the amount of insulin that a patient needs. Really cool, not very helpful. <laughs> um, on the other side, we had a physician, uh, a surgeon leading uh, a key cl clinical process where surgeons were simply shown the cost of supplies for the procedures that they were performing and then allowed to see how much their colleagues were spending for the same procedure and what, impl what uh, uh, things they were using. As an example, we had a screw for an orthopedic hip surgery, who's needing hip surgery, uh, that cost $1,000, and another screw that cost 50 cents. And our data showed that there was no material difference between the $1,000 screw and the 50 cent screw. And so our physician leader, went to all the physicians, pointed the data out, and then went to the company and said, we will no longer purchase screws from you. Unexpectedly, that company came back to us and said, how about if we charge you 75 cents and you continue to be a partner of ours? <laughs> um, they said, well, we will do that if you will allow us to work with you and using our data on improving your products. And so that was uh, successful. So it's important, we think, to focus on certain contexts, um, both for health care. In the United States, as you know, we don't do anything to keep people healthy. We feed them high-calorie foods, and we wait for them to get sick, right? And then we have excellent health care. If you get in a car accident or you have cancer, you want to be in America. Um, if you want to be healthy, you should be here. <laughs> Uh, we, we don't spend a lot of time in health promotion, but those are really powerful areas to think about where your key clinical um, processes are. What are the tools that we use? We, we started back in 1972 building an electronic health record system for one hospital, LDS Hospital, our flagship hospital. And in 2010, we installed our own software in our 24th hospital, the last hospital. It took a long time to do that. We've since transitioned to a single electronic health record across the entire system. So for in all 24 hospitals, in all 185 clinics, one system, one record, um, one place for physicians to go and get the data and for patients also to get their own data. The next thing is the ability to get at the data and analyze the data. Um, we also have a strong telemedicine capability we decided not to go with industry in this area, although there were very powerful industry partners that produce um, good solutions like uh, Philips' uh, solution for the ICU. We decided it was more sensible to develop our own capacity and our own capability 
to put video cameras in rooms, uh, recorders in rooms, microphones in rooms, speakers in rooms, and we've done that. So what do we do with our telemedicine? A broad range of things. And the things that we thought would be valuable early on turned out maybe not to be so valuable, and other things that we stumbled onto have been extraordinarily valuable. An example, uh, one of the things we thought would be really valuable in the early days was a, a social nicety. We thought it would be great to show grandmas and grandpas all across the United States what their new grandbaby looked like by installing a webcam over the baby bassinet. And while that was very nice, we ran into sort of data issues. Who has the right to see that baby? What if somebody hacks into that camera, you know? Um, a lot of concerns like that. But what we discovered was much more useful was to put that same camera, that microphone, that speaker on the resuscitation table when a baby is first born. And then, if a nurse detects that something is going poorly with the resuscitation effort, can push a button and instantly be connected with one of our neonatologists in one of our five centers of excellence. We have decreased the incidence of transfers of babies from outlying hospitals to central hospitals by hundreds of patients every year saving millions and millions of dollars and saving many lives and many days spent in the NICU. Unfortunately, we've also decreased the need for NICU intensivists. I don't know if that's unfortunate or not. I think it's right-sizing. I'm a physician myself, and I think as, as we make these changes, I know that in the United States we have a, a great overabundance of anesthesiologists, orthopedic surgeons, ENTs, uh, car pr uh, procedural cardiologists, basically people that can do pr things to us, not keep us healthy, but can do procedures to us. As we uh, adapt and become more like you in, in promoting health, uh, I would expect a shift in our physician workflow force. We have a web-based development team and a mobile development team that can create applications for our key clinical processes, um, and those things are very powerful for us. So, um, there are some solutions that have made a huge impact. I've already mentioned the uh, neonatal resuscitation effect, but we monitor all 216 of our ICU beds remotely, 24-7. We make sure that every patient in every one of those beds is receiving all of the recommended um, uh, cares. And uh, we have a huge decrease in mortality and morbidity and a huge decrease in the length of time that people spend in intensive care units in Intermountain Healthcare because of those efforts. I won't go through all of these because of our time, but suffice it to say that when we align our innovation efforts with what we call a key clinical process, we have great success. So what is a key clinical process at Intermountain Healthcare? It has four elements. Number one, that process affects a great number of people. It, a lot of people have to go through it. Number two, there's a high degree of risk of morbidity or mortality or a high degree of cost associated with that process. Number three, we, can't, we know who provides the process and we have influence and can work with all of the people on that team. And number four, we can detect through our data or other mechanisms that there's a lot of variability in how that process is delivered. If we can find those four things, we know we will save many, uh, many dollars and many lives by, just, by simply moving to a standardized approach uh, to getting that done. And so all of these things on the left represent efforts that save many millions of dollars, over hundreds of millions of dollars every year compared to the way we did things before and many different lives. So for example, our sepsis admission tool um, started development in 2004. Our physicians firmly believed that we were doing everything we could for, sep for septic patients. And uh, sepsis is when bacteria gets in the bloodstream, causes symptoms. The mortality rate in the United States is 27%. At Intermountain Healthcare in 2004, the mortality rate from sepsis was 24%. And there were those that argued that there was no use working on that because we were beating the national average. But we could identify, a lot of people go through it, um, it's very high risk of mortality and morbidity. We know all the people that have to treat it, and there's a lot of variability in how it's done. And so we knew if we worked on it, we would have benefit. In two years' time, we drove the mortality rate from 24% to 6%.
that means that Intermountain Healthcare, every year, 85 people survive that did not survive. 85 people are at Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving dinner who were not there the year, who would not have been there the way we did things that, before. And we save our system about $40 million a year um, with that effort. So again, focusing on key clinical processes, applying the tools that we have at our disposal to um, work from shared baselines of care. You, you'll notice that I don't say the, word, uh, the words standard care. That is because our physicians hate that term. They hate the term we were going to standardize care because it is impossible to write a protocol that will fit every patient. In fact, some will argue it's impossible to write a protocol that even fits one patient because people are so you know, varied and different. But what we say to our physicians is, we will work from a shared baseline of care in this key clinical process. And what that means is, we expect you to come to the table and lead the development of a shared baseline of care. And when it's done, and when we've put it in place, and when we've educated everyone about how it will run, it's your responsibility responsibility doctor, it's your responsibility nurse to step away from that shared baseline of care as needed by your patients. We demand that you do it. And that's helped us uh, quite a bit culturally. So what have we learned from working with partners in just the last few three minutes that I have here by my count? <laughs> we have learned that it is very important to try your best not to just do something because everybody else is doing it to not just follow a trend, but to understand very clearly why you're implementing an electronic solution. Um, that's something that happened in the United States, where because of the program, the federal government program called Meaningful Use, there were $44 billion set aside for hospitals and clinics to implement electronic health records, and everyone's doing it, so we better get our money, we better jump on and do it too. Big boon to the electronic health record um, companies, at least the good ones. Um, but many organizations did not know why they were installing that electronic health record and so did not reap the benefits. And you'll read articles that say, why did we do this? Why did we spend this money? We don't feel that way. We know why we invested the money and we know the benefits we're getting out of it and we would highly recommend any other organization to follow that same path, but you need to know why you're doing it. Number two, work with companies that are financially, structurally, culturally, and politically healthy. Um, in my early career in the 1997, I implemented an electronic health record for a healthcare system. And within about uh, seven years, the company was gone. <laughs> that was our chart. We had no support. Uh, that's becoming less and less of a problem in the United States anyway, because we're kind of seeing who the winners are and who the stable companies are. Um, deal with companies that have similar values and whose, whose missions align. And this really has to do uh, currently with our, with our Cerner example. Uh, that's the, I'll, I'll mention the name Cerner just because we uh, selected that electronic health record to put into all of our hospitals and all of our clinics. Uh, a company that believes as we do that um, health is more important than health care, that um, health care is extremely important and needs to get better. And so there are certain cultural alignments, but we also recognize that we have different missions. As a healthcare organization and as Cerner, we have different missions. And so we've created a business partnership where we are working together for 10 years. For 10 years, we have all access to any software that Cerner develops. But they will come to Salt Lake City, they send 120 people to Salt Lake City to um, help us develop, help us to use their electronic health record in new ways. And um, th uh, they've done that. We're now at a, at a resizing point where we don't need 120 people. We're cutting back significantly because we've trained ourselves to do many of the tasks that uh, they were doing for us. But one of the things that we recognized is we used to develop our own software and we felt very strongly about that, but we were not good at scale. We were not good at getting our programs everywhere. Our partner is much better at that than, than we are. They're better at stability, they're better at speed, uh, they're better at access. We are better at understanding how to use the tool and how to get value out of it. And so we keep uh, that separate. The other thing that we've learned is uh, I have, I have uh, friends here in Europe who are in the sales force of our company, I like them a great deal, but we deal with the owners uh, of the company and make sure that we understand each other clearly. We had a mistake when we did that with GE um, a few years ago and we were not clear 
what our mission was and what GE's mission was. And after a 10-year effort and many uh, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on their side and not so much on ours, that effort ceased. So I'm going to stop there because my time is up and we'll, we'll move on to a, a panel discussion. But I uh, appreciate very much the, the opportunity to come and speak with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris, for a truly inspiring uh, story. Um, what would you say has been the most challenging thing uh, in developing this relationship with your supplier, with the industry, Cerner in this case? Uh, well, I think the most challenging thing is getting phys helping physicians to understand the benefit of doing this. Um, they hear a lot of horror stories about other organizations that have implemented electronic health record and how it's changed their life. So the approach that we took was to work with Cerner as a partner to highly customize their software for our clinical situation. So as an example, Cerner typically has five physician subtypes, surgeon, obstet obstetrician, gynecologist, you get the idea. We have 55. What does that mean? It means that any, if I'm an endocrinologist in the operating room, I will have a different view of the software than if I'm an endocrinologist, or, or if I'm an ENT surgeon in the operating room, I'll have a different view than if I'm an ENT surgeon in my office. And what that allows me to do is highly customize what I see. It allows for great efficiency and a lot less time spent by clinicians in the electronic health record. But doing that requires that you engage physicians early and that you listen to their criticisms and show them that you are listening by responding to the things that they say. Okay, thank you. So uh, we're going to move, rush into the panel discussion to hear a bit more about what the Swedish counterparts think about uh, your experiences. So, so I'm going to introduce the panel. Please step up, all of you, mm -hmm. all five of you, and I'll introduce you. Uh, Dolores Ehrmann, uh, the chairman uh, of the eHealth board in mm -hmm. regional uh, in, uh, region Skåne. Uh, Simon Rustin, the vice cha chairman of the eHealth board. And uh, we also have uh, Katharina Attebrandt from IBM. Uh, and you are the, the client executive for Healthcare Sweden. So the contact point for, for healthcare within IBM. And we have uh, Jenny Nordbein from Vinova, director of, uh, that's your, uh, Title, right? Director, simply. Of health and life sciences. Excellent. And finally, but not least, uh, Patrick Sundström from SKL. Warm welcome to this uh, prestigious uh, panel. Thank you. Thanks. So, first out, I would like to ask uh, Dolores and Simon. Um, you have, in Regent Skåne, you have dedicated 200 million kroners to to help Sweden become number one in digitalization in the world, and hopefully for Skorna to become number one in Sweden. That's an ambitious uh, effort. Where do you see your plans uh, synchronized with the efforts or the experiences from Intermountain Healthcare here? I identified during your presentation, Chris, a couple of things that I think that give me a lot of hope, because I think we are doing, uh, going in the right direction. Uh, one of the things is um, you talk about the core of a company and how important it was that digitalization was a high in high in the agenda of uh, on really related to the core of a company and I think that our strategy that we decided politically in the region it's really one important document uh, that really makes a points out at the digitalization as a very, very important tool to face the challenges we have ahead. And um, this policy is also containing what we want. You said how important it was to describe why are you buying the new record system. And that is really uh, explained in this policy in this region's corner strategy. So that makes me hope that, okay, we are doing one good thing. The other thing is we are uh, right now identifying the good um, companies that can deliver this uh, unique system for, for records. And I think that uh, that process we are doing with um, what is called, it's a, a special way of uh, public procurement. 
uh, where you discuss with business, with industry, uh, what you want, and in this discussion you come uh, to the decision of who will be the best mm -hmm. uh, for delivering this system. And that's, I identify as one of the um, successful uh, steps to take to, to make a good digitalization. Okay. Um, and then um, I think we should work harder in this identifying the critical um, processes. Okay. I think that was a very good uh, suggestion that I take with me as a thing that we are probably not doing right now, but okay. we should be become better. Simon, what do you say? I um, also think that we have a lot to learn from, uh, from you and, and everything you say. Uh, and as Dolores say, we need to have a clear goal, and we have, uh, we need to work towards that goal, and we need to have uh, uh, to dare to put demands on the supplier of the care system for us, because we are the experts in giving care to our customers, and they are the experts in developing that system, and we also need to work with the data, as you say. We have the data; we know what's going on with the data and uh, we want to help you integrate it into your system and into your process uh, to make it work perfectly. Okay. Katarina, uh, from an IBM point of view, uh, or the industry point of view, when you hear this example and this story, um, do you recognize this, this uh, speed and agility and innovation spirit uh, when you work together with uh, healthcare providers in Sweden? Absolutely, in one sense. Uh, I, I think one of the most important points is this partnership view. The partnership between the industry and the healthcare providers and uh, how for the future and today that becomes more and more important. Uh, no one can do it on their own. You really need to have both perspective where I think that uh, the industry can uh, contribute with the experience, lessons learned from similar projects like this that has been done elsewhere. Uh, we are a fairly small com uh, country. <laughs> we haven't really done everything here yet, so I think uh, I think that that's one very important point. And also, when setting up this partnership, that you really are looking at what do you want to gain from this partnership? How do we fit together? That you have really well-defined partnerships already from the start and working really close together, where both really want to aim something with the same goal. And is this happening? Uh, and this is your... happening, yes. Yeah? yes. I okay. think that's, uh, that those discussions have started in Sweden Excellent. as well. Yeah. Thank you. And from uh, the SQL and Vinova yeah. point of view, the national uh, perspective, how well, do you see Swedish healthcare systems actually be uh, prepared for this kind of transition? Yeah. Potek. First of all, I would like to say I'm, I'm really impressed of your journey. I had the opportunity to visit you some years ago, and what really struck me those uh, uh, then was uh, how you had put quality improvement as the core strategy of all the dimensions of your business. Uh, whether you're talking about management, staff planning, recruiting, investments or IT, you have quality improvement as a guide. And I think your way of organizing, uh, orga uh, organizing your work around this uh, has inspired a lot of leaders in Sweden. Uh, and in fact, partly inspired by the way you do it in, in Intermountain. Now we have launched a national model in Sweden for quality management that soon will um, run across all the county councils, I hope. You have your friends from UN Shipping over there, they are nodding, so I'm, I'm telling the truth. Um, but another thing that is really uh, on the table now in Sweden is the transformation towards new IT systems. Uh, and and he, here there is much from us to learn, definitely, uh, from your journey. And I think it's really impressing the thing, uh, things you're doing when you invest a lot in, you, in your own development. Uh, upon uh, the system you bought uh, uh, from Cerner, and I think today it's the only way to really uh, do it custom-made. So we would like to hear a little bit more about that. Jenny, what do you say about uh, the, the Swedish uh, innovation climate for better healthcare? I, I think that it's, it's a very good point right now, because we've spent the last 10 years in really preparing for this uh, paradigm shift that we are now in the middle of. So, and, and, and I think that we are starting to see now from many of the regions and from uh, SQL at the same time that this is now the change management that we want to see on all levels. And it's 
I think it's also really driven from uh, from the staff and from that perspective, uh, as well as from society and patients. So I, I, we are in that uh, changing position now. And I think that uh, from a very interesting uh, presentation that you gave on, on the intermodal system, we have a lot of differences, of course, but we also have similarities. Definitely. We are in a holistic system. So there's so many interchanges and learnings uh, that we can take uh, uh, and also uh, give back on that. Completely agree. Chris, do you have a, a, I don't know how much you know about the Swedish healthcare system, uh, but so far the reflections you've heard, how do you see the differences between uh, your ecosystem of healthcare and, and what is present in Sweden? Well, I think um, you are, you have invested a lot more in social programs and in health uh, building up programs than we have. We are beginning as a nation to recognize that for Inter at, at Intermountain, we've recognized that for some time. But other than the than the um, the speed at which we've uh, implemented things, I think there's so much more in the way of alignment. Uh, we both are responsible for every life that comes through our doors. We uh, we need to have to create sustainability to have strong nations. Uh, the American healthcare system is not sustainable right now, and we all know that. And so, the Utah healthcare system actually is sustainable. And so we, we think that's uh, exciting and, and we have enjoyed learning from you over the years. There's been a lot of visitors come to Intermountain Healthcare and we look forward to creating uh, sister learning relationships where um, if, you are, if you're accessing your data to improve your pr key clinical processes, we would love to learn from you what have you done and what's worked and have you learned from us because we think that's the next acceleration. Once we have similar tools, then we can, we can move faster. Then we're looking at the hockey stick, maybe, oh. in development. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, digitalization, uh, as we see it here, is uh, perhaps mostly thought of as replacing analog processes with digital ones. But since digitalization also means uh, providing tools for new stakeholders to get involved, like the patients or uh, their families, for instance, uh, how do you s how have you seen this happen or affect your your process or your journey uh, when you've involved new stakeholders into the process? Absolutely. I mean, um, one of the things that happens with technology is that through your, you know, your cell phone, you have patients coming in saying, look, doctor, I have every blood pressure, I have every, pul every beat of my heart for the last three months. Would you like to see that? And as physicians, we go, no. <laughs> I do not need to see every beat of your heart for the last three months. It's not of interest to me. What is, you, what is important to realize is that these technologies are now ubiquitous in the hands of our patients. We need them at the table, guiding us what we do, but we also need to continue to focus on those key clinical processes. How do we prevent diabetes? We know, for example, that we can cut in half the cost of caring for one individual who is pre-diabetic by preventing them from getting diabetes. And that's something that we can, we can do. It doesn't even require medication, it requires exercise and health. But we have to find the right ways to incentivize that and work on it. So we have to do the same thing I mentioned here, not just allow the technology, just because it can be done and it's cool and exciting, that doesn't mean we should do it. We need to, to use those technologies and those patient interactions uh, to focus on key clinical processes. The other thing I would say is that it's so important at every level to bring patients and other stakeholders to the design table, and not just the design table, but the why did it fail table, and why did it fail again, so that we can iterate on improving that process until it's functioning seamlessly and until it's functioning well. You can't do it with just the doctors. You can't do it with just the nurses. Every stakeholder has to be there. Jenny, do you want to comment on this? Yes, and I think that that is uh, something that we could uh, learn of a lot from that way of working. And we are actually now looking at how we can have policy labs in Sweden, looking at our policies, looking at our regulations, our ways of working. Uh, what are the, the really limitations that we have and what is really just in our minds? And we've done that actually in the financial sector already, a highly regulated sector, together with both the governmental agencies and the businesses. Uh, and we are doing a, a pilot with the National Board on Health and Social Welfare. 
So that is something that is coming because I think that we are, in many discussions and ways, uh, we, we're hindered from, from the process that we think that we have uh, regulations and hinders that we cannot uh, come about. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is something that I, I would like to use and really utilize when is it working and when is it not working and how do we make it work. Ah, so the policies uh, you say are needed, uh, the mutual policies as uh, to borrow from other industries, um, although uh, Chris said standardization of procedures is probably not a successful way, but policies are necessary still to make things uh, interoperate and, and work together. Yeah, I think that, that if you don't understand your policy and, and what it uh, really encompasses, uh, then you, we have so many different ways of looking at the policies in the different regions of Sweden. There's where we need to get really a uh, holistic grip on that. Okay. Yeah, I totally agree. I agree. I think we have to look at, you know, kind of the policies when it comes to legislation, uh, reimbursement models. I would like to see a well, kind of wel welfare lab or uh, uh, more I would like to see kind of bureaucratic free zone where we could be able to test the solutions and partnerships in a controlled area and then evaluate uh, which value it creates for the patients. Uh, but we definitely need to kind of find the obstacles for innovation mm. with a, within our structure. Dolores. Great, so uh, SQL is on board. Excellent. <laughs> Dolores, is yes. Skona on board for, to, to host a policy lab for healthcare? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Come to us. <laughs> no, but I think that we have be, we've been very bad at including the patient in the processes and the development of a, a process in the healthcare. And we have a big challenge there because the best products that are, that are being developed uh, are done in a way in a design that includes stakeholders that will use these products, like designing apps for uh, young people that has a uh, problems with the, the um, sick, um, phys sick is, oh, what is it in English? Uh, yeah, they, they are um, health. Yeah, no, the, the mental psychology, health. mental health, thank right. you, psychology. Uh, and those are the most successful ones, right? So this patient in, uh, integration in the development of uh, the key processes is really important. And there we have a, a problem because we have a tradition where these processes has, has been developed by the, the doctors and the nurses and uh, in a scientific way. But we have, this is also a scientific way, what the patient wants and what they need and what they can provide for information for the process to become better. Uh, and not less when we are starting talking about prevention and lifestyles, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but then we have also a problem, I think it's a good idea to have a lab, but then we have the problem with scaling up. Ah. Uh, we have labs in different ways, technish, for technology, or for, and now it's a policy lab you're talking about, Jenny, but then we have the problem, we make the lab, we get, find a good solution, but it doesn't become a reality. Ah. And scaling up, I think it's one of the yeah. problems. Okay, Chris. Yeah, if I may, just a little bit about that. That was a huge problem we had with our information systems. We could do it at one hospital, we could do it at a second. We couldn't do it at all 24. So what we did um, in our current um, effort is really to redefine structure and governance over the project. We do have a committee that um, sits at the top of this implementation project that oversees the whole thing. But we also have regional leaders, local leaders, individual leaders. Uh, I can go into the structure of that a little bit more. But we also have a workflow process that iterates every two weeks. So our clinicians expect that every two weeks a new upgrade of our system will occur. Um, that gets them used to a lot of change that comes quickly, but it allows us to deal with something like where a policy was made centrally and with the best of intentions, but when it was implemented, it created a lot of problems and roadblocks. If there's a, a, a every two week meeting where patients and clinicians and physicians can come to the table and say, oh, that was terrible, let me tell you why. Then two weeks later, we can improve things, and two weeks later, we can make things even better, and two weeks later, so on and so forth. And that gets us not only to rapid improvement, but scale because we push those initiatives then out over the entire system, not just in one doctor's office. We, we will begin making sure things that are safe and they're improving in one or two places. But once we're convinced they're reproducible, we now can push that um, training and tool set out across the entire organization in a period of about three days. Wow, so, very impressive. powerful. Uh, Jenny, you had a comment there. 
totally agree. It cannot be a lab on the side. It must be a lab. It's in the structure yeah. from the top to the bottom and everyone uh, online because that's where we can have the rapid prototyping and actually mm. proving is our policies working or do we need to change the policies or, or are we just working in the wrong way? Mm -hmm. Katarina, uh, the, the, the Intermountain system used four factors for s uh, sorting out or, or qualifying projects. Uh, the, the high volume of people, the, the, the impact basically uh, and the high variability. Do you recognize these, these key factors when you work uh, in developing processes for healthcare? Yes, or especially that it's very good to have this type of criteria for when, when are we going to move forward, how are we going to move forward, to have some kind of governance and design process. For example, for uh, if you're looking at the innovation and app development, that you actually have a governance structure. Uh, th that you reuse uh, experience that are done from other wares uh, and well-defined process and criteria. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think that was a, a really um, clear and, and um, uh, inspiring way to, to look at it and, and describe it. Simon, uh, what, what do you see as the lowest hanging fruits when Skåne is about to take on or really accelerate on this journey uh, inspired by Intermountain Healthcare? to not be afraid to use our data for a, a developing purpose, both in our own ways and, and with the help of startups and big companies and everything, uh, and also to dare to include uh, patients. Hmm. Uh, we have, uh, we, we see that we ha are moving from, like Dolores say, uh, a, a structure where the power is laying with the doctors and the uh, nurses towards the patients and we need to uh, involve them but because if you don't involve them in our processes they will find other ways to get the care that they want mm -hmm. and we will do our thing and they will do their thing and the market will move with the patients uh, so we will need to involve everyone and to collaborate with the uh, companies and with each other and with uh, SQL and Minova and, and uh, everyone uh, that is in the process because if we work we solely on ourselves we will only work in the tubes that we do today we need to get rid of the tubes and and work uh, in, in a flat environment instead of in our own separate ways ah so that's that's the, the key focus uh, both a challenge and an opportunity um, I want to just ask if there's any questions from the floor here, of the audience. Uh, uh, yes, can we have a microphone to... Where do we have the microphone? Yes, Where's Klaus? Yes, over here to the left. What's your name and where do you come from? Hi, my name is Joel Johnson and I'm coming from SAS Institute. And I'm hearing you talk about a lot of about labs and policy labs. And you also talked a lot about advanced decision support systems. Mm -hmm. But are you thinking anything about data labs within the organizations or within your own structure? So who do you want uh, to answer the question? Uh, whoever feels. <laughs> so is that maybe uh, for, for uh, Intermountain, for Chris? Sure, I can, I can give you time to think. Ready? Yeah. So <laughs> we have Thank you, Chris. <laughs> a central enterprise data warehouse team who's who is really a technical team and their job is to figure out how to get the data and how to keep it safe and private. Mm -hmm. So they get data not only from our electronic health record system but also from our state public registry and also the LDS church has a wonderful genealogical system that includes disease information. So now we can find families of people that have this disease condition and we can go back and gather medical histories and genetic material from those people and include that. So there's a central technical team, and then there is an analytical team, and the, anal the um, analytic teams are owned. Uh, there's a central team, but also uh, we find it useful to have teams in regions, teams in individual hospitals, and sometimes in large clinics mm. that can focus on getting us the information about a certain key clinical process. Jenny, you wanted to comment How was on that? This? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yes, we have uh, a lot of funding to intelligent decision support. What I'm thinking now is that we should work more on predictive analytics also on a systemic level, because that is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Katharina, uh, maybe it's a question for IBM to uh, how, how do you see the data lab or data warehouse structures uh, central in, in this? I think, I mean, back to 
what you discussed, it's extremely important that you make use of the data. I think that's a trouble in Sweden right now. How are we actually going? We have the data, but how are we actually going to make use of that? How are we going to leverage that to have more equal care, evidence-based care, etc.? So, yeah. I, I also and, think, I mean, if you put quality improvement in front of everything, then you understand that you have to invest in, in, in this kind of data management and build own capacity, I think, uh, definitely. Yeah. I think we shouldn't forget in, in our Swedish context uh, that we have the laws we have when it comes to data and uh, not less, not the less in, um, uh, within the, the healthcare mm. and that we need to look through the data and we need to, the legislation and we need to probably uh, modernize it and uh, then that we absolutely need to concentrate us uh, ask, uh, about uh, what are the consequences mm. and uh, sometimes we over interpret our own laws and probably uh, make an excuse this is not possible the law doesn't allow it and uh, mm. so we need to work really on many levels here both on the technical and the lab but non mm. nonetheless a strong uh, overview and control and uh, mm. to look over our legislation Simon, you will get the last remark here before we're running yeah. late. I will, I will say that we need to work with the legislation as well. It's one okay. of the key processes to make that work with uh, a modern society. And also, we need to, to uh, take knowledge from the private side of the part, uh, as us in, in the public, to um, be able to make data non-personable and searchable and work with data mining and big data. Uh, because if we do so, we will be better at preventing care than all just be a, a reaction care yeah. in such. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although uh, the legal aspects are truly important, I was actually uh, really uh, more inspired by the speed of, of the innovation uh, and, and that is actually seems to be doable. And it actually seems to be hope for my hip replacement when I will eventually need it. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much to the panel, Patrick, uh, Jenny, Dolores, uh, Katarina, Simon and Chris Wood, a warm hand, and we will continue our discussion down in the round table room. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for coming.